cute little, very, very simple pressure volume lab. Uh, they have some very nice little pressure transducers. You hook a syringe up to it, you push on the syringe, you can read the pressure in the system. Well, you do that for four or five different settings on your syringe, plot it out, and it's going to look just like we're going to do here today. <clears throat> Let's go way back, way back machine here to chapter one, where we were talking about physical states. Remember, <clears throat> when we talk about a physical state, it's a physical property, solid, liquid, or gas. Iceberg, water, water vapor. Water is actually the only substance that naturally exists in all three states um, here on Earth. <coughs> when we have a solid, we remember that they have defined shapes and defined volumes. When we have a liquid, we know that they have a defined volume, but they take on the shape of their container. A gas, on the other hand, has neither a defined shape nor volume, and it'll take on the shape and the volume of whatever container we're in. We're dealing here with gases, so that's what we're going to talk about. Now remember, we said that these things occur, the states of matter occur, because we have intermolecular forces between atoms and molecules. That makes them sticky. They stick to each other. Think about a lump of magnets. And the attractive force here would be magnetism. And this would be a solid, if you will, because the things are stuck together. They have a defined volume and a defined shape. As we put more and more energy into these things, we're going to undergo changes in our state because we're putting enough energy in to overcome the intermolecular forces. So we start here with our solid. It's like a lump of magnets. They're just sitting there. Now, in reality, nothing is ever still. It's always moving. <clears throat> so these are vibrating, but they don't have enough energy to get away from each other. They're stuck. Now, if we take this system and we put in a bit more energy, we go to the liquid phase, the liquid state. Here we put in enough energy that the particles finally have enough energy to move away from each other, but they still can't get away. They just kind of slip and slide all over each other. That's why they can take on the, sh the shape of the container but they can't get away to fill the container. And then finally, if we take this stuff and we put in enough energy to overcome all of the attractive forces, we wind up with a gas. In a gas, we have put in enough energy <clears throat> that we can totally break all of the attractive forces between the particles. Because of that, they just fly around madly until they hit the walls, or they could hit each other. But they'll travel in a straight line until they hit something, and then they'll bounce off. That's what a gas does. And that's why a gas will totally fill a container and take on its shape. Now, like we said way back in chapter one, because of this, <clears throat> well, the bottom line here, the amount of energy you put in defines if it's going to be a solid, liquid, or gas. And because the intermolecular forces are unique for every substance, they're unique, the transition from one to the other is a unique temperature. So that's what we mean by melting point and boiling. All right, so recapping what we know about gases. 
And remember, this is the chapter on gases. <clears throat> in the gas phase, a gas will have an indefinite shape, taking on the shape of its container. Because there's so much, if you go back here and look at this, or maybe we can't. If you look at this, there's lots and lots of space between these things, isn't there? Unlike these guys that are really packed together, there's lots of open space here. Because of that, you can take a gas and you can expand or compress it. That is, you're squeezing down on the empty space between the molecules or you're opening it up, giving it more space to run. So a gas is compressible. And finally, <clears throat> because they fly off in a straight line, the composition of the gas within any container is always uniform. These things are traveling very, very, very fast. So it doesn't take long at all for a gas molecule to go from here to here, hypersecond. Because of that, <clears throat> the distribution is always uniform. Indefinite shape, compressible, and they diffuse uniformly. All right, let's think a little bit about what's happening when these little guys bounce around and they hit the wall of the container. This is actually, well, this is a movie of it, but this um, <clears throat> resulted from a real-time calculation. What <clears throat> this calculation does is it starts off with a certain number of gas particles. It allows them to travel in a straight line until they either hit the walls or each other, and then they bounce off. The top here is a movable barrier. Now, when these speeding gas particles hit this top barrier, they bump into it, don't they? And when they do that, they transfer a little bit of energy. And what does that do? Well, it pushes the barrier up. The more gas particles you have bumping this, <clears throat> and the harder they bump it, the higher this is going to go. So this little program actually calculates <clears throat> the amount of energy that's transferred to this barrier. This is supposed to be a weight. And as you see, it kind of goes up and down as <clears throat> the uh, number of particles hit it are, are changing in real time. So this is what gas pressure is. Now we all talk about gas pressure. <clears throat> if you listen to the weather, they talk about atmospheric pressure. That's the pressure due to the collision of all the gas particles in the atmosphere with everything at sea level. Now this pressure is actually significant. Gas pressure at sea level, 14.7 pounds per square inch. Now 14.7 pounds, that's a lot. A square inch is a little thing, you know, that big. And we've got 15 pounds of air pressure just from these air um, molecules ramming in to this thing on my hand. 15 pounds. <clears throat> the only reason that we're not totally squished by that <clears throat> is that we have air on the inside. And it's pushing back with the same force. So the two forces cancel. If you go diving, <clears throat> so you go down deep underwater, what happens? You get smooshed by all the pressure, don't you? <clears throat> well, when we talk about measuring air pressure, there are a number of ways to do it. We're going to do this with what's called a barometer. This is the one we've all seen. 
that in the lab there's one on the wall in every lab, one or two even, <clears throat> and they never read the same. But what this simply does is it measures the air pressure and shows it up here on a dial. When a storm comes, storms tend to have circulation. And as they circulate, the middle of the storm has lower pressure. So if the pressure drops, we're down here where we expect rain as opposed to fair skies. High pressure is good. Low pressure means there's a storm. <clears throat> this is a uh, recording barometer. So it's got a little strip of paper, old fashioned thing now, little arm with a bit of ink on it, goes up and down, measures the changes during a day. This is a lab manometer. You put this in line to something, you can measure the pressure within this little loop here. And this guy is kind of fun. Um, I grew up in Florida. And I grew up way back in the day before there were things like satellites, whatever. Well, Florida has hurricanes. <clears throat> and back in the old days, you would have one of these things sitting around. <clears throat> this is captive air in here at some pressure, right? And this end up here is open to the outside. So if the pressure in here is greater than the pressure outside, then the liquid goes up. As it goes up and down, <clears throat> you know, whether you have a storm or not. Well, hurricanes have big time low pressure. So if you happen to be sitting home <clears throat> watching your barometer with nothing else to do, because it was no TV, and suddenly this thing did that, that means that big time storm is coming you better look out. Satellites make it so much easier. We're going to talk about it in terms of a mercury manometer or mercury barometer. Mercury barometer is something that we used to make in lab. And you would make it, you'd put it together, you know, do some measurements, and everybody saw what it was and understood it. The way you make a mercury barometer, you had this little bowl, bowl like this, and it would be full of mercury. And then you would take some of the mercury in a little you know, beaker or something, and you would take a long glass tube, and you would carefully pour the mercury in there. All right, you get the tube full totally full, put your thumb over it, stick your hand down in the big tub of mercury, and let go. Now mercury is very dense, very heavy. So when you let go, it falls a little bit in the tube and creates a vacuum up top here. Now, air pressure is pushing down on our little puddle here, isn't it? Depending upon how hard it pushes, this is going to go up or down. That's how you measure pressure, air pressure here, with a mercury barometer. So you put a scale here, and you measure the height from the puddle up to your mercury. That's how you measure it with a mercury barometer. <coughs> You will see pressure then quoted as millimeters of mercury. That simply is the height of this column. Now you can't make these anymore because they don't let you play with little bowls of mercury, which is a shame, because it really does make it clear as to how the thing works. <clears throat> if we are standing at sea level, Air pressure is defined as exactly 760 millimeters of mercury. When we speak of normal atmospheric pressure, we're talking about a column of mercury 760 millimeters high. 
All right, we measure atmospheric pressure, therefore, <clears throat> using three or four ways. <clears throat> if we're at sea level and our height is exactly 760 millimeters, we call that one atmosphere, one ATO. When you see it written like this, 1 ATM, that's an exact number. Now that's important because that means you don't use it for significant figures, do you? 1 atmosphere and 760 within this context are both exact numbers. Now 761 would not be. That would be an experimental measurement. But if we speak of atmospheric pressure, 1 ATM, 760, exact numbers. Definitions. You can also see millimeters of mercury referred to as TOR, T-O-R-R. I like millimeters of mercury personally <coughs> because it describes what it is. It's the height of the column. You can also measure it in pounds per square inch. Like we said, that's 14.7. That's fine if you want to put air on your tires, but we're not going to use that in chemistry. The most recent way to do this is to measure it in Pascal's PA. <clears throat> we're not going to talk about that in 110. You can do that in 140. At 110, I would just like to stick to the very simple description of millimeters of mercury for atmosphere. Any questions? All right. <clears throat> Let's do a couple of very simple experiments here. <clears throat> That's going to define what we call the pressure volume relationship. This is also called Boyle's law. Boyle was a guy, and he's the one that worked out the math for this. Very simple math, but this will forever be known as Boyle's law. <clears throat> what Boyle said was that the volume occupied by a fixed quantity of gas is inversely proportional to the applied pressure. Inversely proportional to the pressure. All right, let's see what this means. <clears throat> I'm going to use this little apparatus here. This has a captive volume of air, and this is a piston that you can move up and down, just like the syringe that we're going to use in lab. This has a gauge coming out the side. Again, in lab, we will use a fancy pressure transducer. But we're going to do the same thing. All right. Let's say we take our device here. And we put a little tiny weight on top of it. Little tiny thing. Nothing happened much, did it? We have a very small pressure, and we still have our large volume. Now, if we change this, and instead of a very small mass, we put something big on there, what happens? It pushes our plunger way down, our volume decreases and our pressure increases. <clears throat> the volume that we have here is going to be inversely proportional to the pressure. The more pressure we apply up here, the smaller the volume. That's all there is to Boyle's law. 
more pressure, the smaller the volume. Let's do this in terms of a movie. This is the same little device here. And what we're going to do in this movie is we're going to increase our pressure here. So pressure is going to go up. As the pressure goes up, the volume, this stuff, is going to go down. Inversely proportional, pressure goes up, volume goes down. Here we go. Pressure goes up, our volume goes down. Now you may note that this isn't linear, is it? It isn't linear, uh, if you want to think about it in the limit here. It isn't going to be linear because the gas particles themselves must have a volume, right? So if we squeezed it down as much as we possibly could, we would hit a very, very small volume, but it can't ever go to zero. And so that's why as you get higher and higher pressure, the volume drops, but never goes to zero. It's called asymptotic. All right, so it can never drop to zero. It's a nonlinear relationship. We hate nonlinear relationships, don't we? Yeah, but you can solve this here. You can solve it <coughs> with curve fitting. You can do an algorithm of some sort to figure out the shape of this curve, whatever. But remember what Boyle said, that it was a simple inverse relationship. So if we take our data here, now in this plot I have volume here and pressure here. If I take and I plot my volume, not versus pressure, but versus the inverse of the pressure. Okay, remember, higher the pressure, smaller the volume. So that's inverse, one over P. So if I take this and I do volume versus one over P, my gosh, it's linear. That's what Boyle's Law tells us. There is a linear relationship between volume and 1 over the pressure. Now that we have a linear relationship, we can use this to solve simple pressure volume problems. Now, what do we have here? <clears throat> Boyle told us that the volume was going to be inversely proportional to the pressure. That's 1 over P. Okay? We know that. Volume inversely proportional to 1 over P. Or to pressure. <clears throat> this little sign here kind of looks like a Greek alpha, but it's not. Mathematically, it's called a proportionality symbol. <clears throat> a proportionality symbol can always be replaced by an equal sign if you put a constant in there. So this is the same mathematically as this. Equal to some constant times 1 over P. That's just simple math. Whenever we have a proportionality, we can make it an equality just by putting in some constant. All right. Let's look at our two limits here. If we say that volume is some constant versus 1 over P, we could get rid of this 1 over P thing by simply multiplying through, and we could say that PV, our pressure and our volume, is always going to be equal to this constant, whatever that constant is. We don't know what it is, but it's going to be equal to a constant. 
So, in our two examples, we had a large volume and a very small pressure, right? So initially, P1, V1 was equal to some constant. Again, we don't know what the constant is. We don't care. Now we're dealing with our same sample of gas here. So over here, where we put lots of pressure on it, and our volume is small, P2 and V2 are still equal to the same constant. It's the same sample of gas, the same apparatus. P2, V2 is still equal to the same constant. Now think about that. P1, V1 is equal to some number. P2, V2 is equal to the same number, isn't it? Same number. Constants are the same. If this is true, we can take and ignore the constant altogether and simply say P1, V1 must equal P2, V2. For a two-state system, where you're starting with some volume and simply changing our pressure, we can always write P1, V1 must equal P2, V2. Pressure is small, volume is big. Pressure is big, volume is small. That's all there is to boil water. Any questions? All right, how does this show up in a problem? We have 12 and a half liters. <clears throat> we measure our pressure in this 0.82 atmospheres. This is P1, V1, isn't it? We change our pressure from 0.82 to 1.32. So that's P2. What is our final volume? <clears throat> what we remember is that P1V1 must equal P2V2. So you take that, you write it out, and you say, what do I know, what don't I know? I know everything except our final volume, V2. I know everything else. So we're going to take this and just substitute. P1, V1, P2, V2. Our initial pressure volume must equal our final pressure volume. So V2 is just going to be P1, V1 over P2, mathematically. Because it's kind of the same like the C1, V1? Mm -hmm. This is just like C1, V1. V1, C2, V2, same math, isn't it? Yeah. All right, let's substitute. 0.82 atmospheres, 1.25 liters, final pressure 1.32. Atmospheres will cancel. <clears throat> Do our simple math, and we have 7.8. So we started off with 12 and a half liters. We increased our pressure. The volume went down to 7.8. That is Boyle's law. Any questions? <clears throat> Have 150 mils of gas. Our pressure is 35 millimeters of mercury. We're going to change our volume to 50 mils. What's our pressure? Think about our syringe that you're going to use in the lab. <clears throat> you're starting at the 150 mil mark. <clears throat> you squeeze it down to the 50 mil mark. So our volume decreases, our pressure must increase. 
we are going to take our basic equation and solve for P2. Here's where we are. We're going to solve this for P2. So we want P1, V1 over V2. Why don't you take your calculators and very <coughs> make friends with them again. They're not speaking to you after last week. <laughs> now you'll note here that when we set this up, we don't have to change these to liters, do we? Because we're going to have the same units top and bottom. As long as the units are the same, they're OK. Because they're just going to cancel. Our pressure is then going to be 35 times 150 divided by 50 for 106 millimeters of mercury. When you're doing these problems, you don't have to put the mercury in. Just writing millimeters is enough. Well, I know you all like doing problems. Oh, not yet. Here we have helium. Our pressure is 860. We have a different container. Our volume is 25 liters. The pressure is 770 millimeters. What was the initial volume? Now, there are lots of words here. But again, it's the same. Thing, isn't it? We're just going to do this and solve for V1. Solve that for V1. V2, V2 over P1. Go ahead, set it up, run the numbers. Our units here are millimeters of mercury. They're both going to cancel. Again, your pressure units must be the same in the initial and final. Here we have liters. Do our math. Our volume is 22.1 liters. Now, <clears throat> this problem was actually reverse engineered so that it turned out to be 22.4. You know why? Because we will see later in this chapter that if you take any gas at all, any gas, any gas, and you have 22.4 liters of it, and it's at one atmosphere at 25 degrees centigrade, that volume mass of that volume will be the molar mass of the gas. That's the amazing thing we're going to discover. 22.4 is our magic number. This is one mole of any gas. Now comes a tutorial. <clears throat> Again, very simple questions. Just practice them. We have a volume of five or a pressure of five atmospheres, a volume of 5,050 milliliters. We're changing our volume to 5.62 liters. What's the pressure? Again, in atmospheres. We have to have the same volumes in our units, right? So we'll just make them both <coughs> I made them both. Oh, here. I converted 5.62 liters to milliliters. I could have done it either way, right? I just did that. You 
to go it either way. <clears throat> We're looking for P2. That's going to be P1, V1 over V2. Plug in our numbers here. 45.38 is a solution or rounding to three significant figures, 4.54 atmospheres. Let's do another one. Our initial pressure is 2350 millimeters. Our volume is um, 8520 mils. We're gonna change our pressure <clears throat> from uh, 2350 millimeters to 5.6 atmospheres. Now, our pressure units have to be the same, don't they? How do you go from millimeters to atmospheres? millimeters for every atmosphere. So, if we take 5.6 atmospheres and simply multiply it by 760, because every atmosphere is 760, right? We get 4260 millimeters. Can you do the other one? You can do it the other way. Yep. Doesn't matter as long as they're the same. 760 is a magic number. All right, <clears throat> we're going to solve for V2. That's going to be P1, V1 over P2. We plug it in. Three significant figures. We're at 3.58 liters. Now, please go and practice these until you're sick of it. Because <clears throat> these calculations are simple. The conversions are so, but again, you just need to practice. Let's quickly look at our next relationship. This is temperature volume. All right, <clears throat> temperature volume. What we're going to do here is change the temperature of a gas and we're going to look at the effect on the volume of the gas. So, I have a balloon. The balloon has a defined volume, doesn't it? I'm going to make that balloon very, very cold by dumping liquid nitrogen all over it. Liquid nitrogen is 196 centigrade. After the liquid nitrogen evaporates, the balloon is going to warm back to room temperature. Fun thing to watch. It's even more fun to do. Here comes our liquid nitrogen. And as we cool our balloon, it shrinks way down. As it slowly warms back to room temperature. By George, it slowly reinflates. So what did we learn in this simple experiment? We learned that when the temperature goes down, the volume goes down. And when the temperature goes back up, the volume goes back up. This is a linear direct relationship. Temperature is increased, volume increases. Temperature decreases, the volume decreases. This is what's known as Charles's Law. Charles was his last name, so this is Charles's. Charles's law <coughs> looks something like this. 
we're going to have a linear relationship between temperature and volume. Now, playing with balloons is fun. But you know, chemists like to plot things out, don't they? So let's look at a plot of this. What I'm going to do is take different molar amounts of a gas. I'm going to change its temperature. And I'm going to measure its volume. OK, that's a reasonable thing to do, right? So let's start off with 0.25 mole. As I lower my temperature, the volume decreases. Right? That's what we saw with our balloon. I go to half a mole. Same thing happens. I lower my temperature, my volume decreases. 0.75 mole, same thing. This is a nice linear relationship. It doesn't matter how many moles, it's always linear. But, notice anything about this curve? As we, this is liquid nitrogen temperature. What would happen if you took all of these and you extrapolated them down to where our volume was zero? Like that. It can't be zero. Of course, it can't be zero. That's why we have to extrapolate. But this point is always the same point. And this magic point is minus 273.15 degrees centigrade. Ever heard of absolute zero? That is absolute zero. Now, what we're going to do is invent a new temperature scale. And we're going to start here at absolute zero. We're going to call this the Kelvin scale. And absolute zero is zero on the Kelvin scale. OK. <clears throat> Let's look at Charles's law, what we just saw mathematically. What we see here is that volume was directly proportional to temperature. Temperature goes down, volume goes down, right? Now we're going to do the same trick we did with oil. We're going to take our proportionality symbol and replace it with an equal K. OK? So. If we rearrange this and pull our k out, we get v over t. Now let's say we're talking about our balloon. If we're at one temperature, we could call that v1, t1. When we cooled it down, we would have v2, t2. And that is Charles's law. Same balloon, initially, V over T must be the same as our final V over T. Now, the one thing you have to remember about Charles is that you must use the Kelvin scale. It must start at absolute zero. How do we do this? Here's our thermometer. Water freezes at zero, right? Boils at 100. On the Kelvin scale, water freezes at 273 and boils at 373. Now, the convenient thing is, you know that there's 100 little bumps here, right? 
there's a hundred bumps here. So the size of the degree is the same. To convert one to the other, all you have to do is take centigrade and add 273. <clears throat> centigrade plus 273 is Kelvin. Take these centigrades, quickly write them in Kelvin. Centigrade plus 273 is Kelvin. So if we're at 1,000 centigrade, we simply add 273, and we're at 1273 Kelvin. If we're at minus 150 centigrade, we still add 273 to it. And this would give us 123 Kelvin. And just like we saw, water boils at 100, add 273, we're at 373 Kelvin. One other technicality you should note, and this is just a technicality, we talk about degrees centigrade, don't we? You notice there's no little degree sign. Kelvin is just called Kelvin, not degree Kelvin. <clears throat> not a big point, but if you hear somebody say that, they're not wrong. It's just Kelvin. All right, we have time to do one problem. We have 50 mils at 26 degrees centigrade. We heat it into our volume is 62 mils. What's the temperature? You look at this, you say Charles is long. <clears throat> we know V1, T1. That's V1, T1. We know V2. We're just going to calculate T1. Or T2, I guess it is. That should be a two. There's our Charles' law. V over T equals V over T. <clears throat> We're trying to get final temperature that's T2. So that's V2, T1 over V1. Oh, wait. Log in our numbers. Before we do that, yeah. remember, we are given a centigrade. We can't use that, can we? We must add 273 to it. So we're just about 300 Kelvin. So, <clears throat> 62 mils, that's our V2. Here's our T1, about 300 Kelvin. Here's our V1, 50 mils. Simply run them together. You'll note that milliliters will cancel. Once again, you can use any volume units as long as they're the same. Temperature always must be Kelvin, but the volume units can be anything because they're going to cancel. Do our math. <clears throat> We're at 373 Kelvin. Three significant figures. We would round it to 374. Now we're not going to do this. I just want to point out that <clears throat> there's a Charles's Law tutorial. If you want to do this, it's the same thing. Make sure your units for volume are the same. Make sure you have centigrade. Plug it in. And you get your, in this case, the temperature. We'll pick up here on Monday. Please remember that this exam makeup is online. Two attempts. Take your time. Do well. Thank you.
No, you can have them. I don't want them. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I never entered the blackboard, did I? Uh, so maybe you need to give them back to me. I'm sorry. So.